Welcome, or very welcome. I do this in both Swedish and English. My name is Ole Jansson, and I'm the head of Campus Gotland, uh, advisor to the vice chancellor of Uppsala University. And we are very proud to, to arrange this seminar together with Riksutställningar, as we say in Swedish, Swedish Agency of Exhibitions, no? Something like that. Uh, uh, I'm very soon going to hand over the microphone to Professor Christer Gustafsson, who is going to introduce you to Luigi Sacco. Uh, but first I had this uh, updrag uh, to check where the people here in the room come from, which sectors. So if every, all the... Uh, alla som kommer från den politiska sektorn kan räcka upp en hand. Trevligt. Hur många kommer från kultursektorn? Mm. Jag har inget annat att göra. Eh, hur många kommer från akademin? Precis. Och hur många kommer från näringsliv? Intressant. Och eh, någon som inte kunde jacka in sig själv i någon av de kategorierna som tillhör övrigt. Ah, interesting. So once again, very welcome. And now I hand over the microphone to Professor Christer Gustafsson. Mm -hmm. <coughs> thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, introduction. And um, I'm very happy that so many people can come to this seminar. I think it's a very important one, not just for me, for 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 the La Futura, La Cultura e Futura, um, but also. Um, um, f for the opportunities to develop these uh, aspects here at uh, Gotland and um, Campus Gotland, Uppsala University, and also hopefully together with you people sitting here representing the public sector, the private sector, and also the press and, um, <coughs> and the research societies, the research community. Um, I am very happy that Pierluigi Sacco had the time to visit us here. Um, I know that you calendar is, is very full, and when I say very full, I really mean very full. Um, you're traveling around the world, more or less all the time, especially for the last period in Europe, and of many reasons, uh, mostly because what you have to say and, and your research is uh, of high quality and very interesting, but also because you are involved in many important um, missions at the, at the moment to develop culture, culture policies on a European level, maybe also on a global level. So <coughs> what we hear today from Professor Sacco um, is um, probably what you will be facing in um, the culture policy program very soon from here on a European level, but also on a national level and probably on a regional level. And I hope that we here in Gotland can take the opportunity to maybe to develop a local or regional version of this thinking to something special. And hopefully that could be also to, together with you, Professor Sacco. Before I give the floor to you, I just want to say something that I think is very interesting about you. And that is you're not coming from the culture sector. You're coming from uh, as a professor in economics and understood the value of culture for the economic development. So. I'm looking forward to listen to this. So please, take the floor. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, everybody. Really, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here because, um, as Chris said, that's a moment in which uh, reflection about uh, potential for culture-led development in Europe is becoming serious and there is an increasing amount of attention from institutions. So at the same time, as I will argue during my presentation, it's also a situation whereby the place of culture in the, for example, the European medium and long-term strategies is far from clear. And it's extremely important that today there's a very 
targeted reflection at the local level to create laboratories that can illustrate the potential of culture in ways that can be taken up also at a higher level, for example, at the European level. And um, for this particular reason, I must say I'm very happy to be uh, here and to have this opportunity to interact with the Swedish reality because in many respects it's one of the realities in Europe which is really receptive uh, to this kind of approach. I, I, I think I can really say this on the basis of a very representative sample because I've traveled basically across the 28 member states and uh, in many cases, uh, especially in this period, I'm really every week changing one country and uh, I really uh, I'm convinced more and more as I come to Sweden that uh, in this particular moment it could be one of the places or, or the place in which a certain type of reflection and practical implementation could really emerge as an interesting uh, leading example. Um, Christer said correctly that I am an economist, but on the other hand it's extremely important for me to remark that uh, practically every time in my activity, I also am constantly focused on um, production projects and interaction, real direct interaction with the cultural professionals. I've been directing an international festival of contemporary art. I'm working with production all the time. I've been, uh, I've been directing the bid of Siena for the European Culture Capital 2019 that unfortunately we didn't get and that would be a long story why, but still. Um, so it's very important to it's very important for me to to, to stress the fact that uh, to really reason about uh, the place of culture in the overall economy is extremely important to understand what cultural everyday practice is all about. So from this point of view, uh, I'm really focused on this, and uh, um, of course I look forward to also very specific questions that might emerge after the presentation to, to, to deal with specific aspects. So what will be the, the purpose of this presentation? Um, it's uh, mainly targeted at providing you with a framework that is gaining, uh, I should say, increasing attention also at the European level, at the Commission level, to rationalize in some sense, to make sense of the evolving relationship between cultural production and economic and social value creation processes. Because, uh, you know, it's not just a academician kind of game. Huh? It's something that is really important to fix and to, in some sense, uh, direct attention to what are the critical issues that are raised and especially what are the differences between different modes of cultural production. We will see there are big differences and especially we are in a moment in which the framework is globally evolving at an astounding pace. So it's really important to have, I think, this kind of theoretical but also very practical huh, kind of way of framing this. But you, you, you will, will be able to have an opinion on this. Okay, so the first part well, my presentation will be targeting, um, giving you the general framework of what I call the approach of culture 3.0, which is basically a way of, uh, you will see, categorizing different phases of the relationship between cultural production and uh, e the economy that uh, imply completely different ways for culture to plug in the rest of the economy and societal organization. Um, after this part on the general presentation, I will deal with some, uh, in some detail with um, two aspects which are particularly important. One is the relation with innovation and so-called crossovers, culturally driven crossovers. And the other one is the issue of cultural participation, which is becoming one of the most critical factors that is affecting the effectiveness of cultural policies today. And that is full, I will see, of paradoxes, so to speak. Um, um, if I would describe in detail the content of this slide, it would take basically the time of the conference. So I just give you a very bird's eye perspective. Uh, of course, then we will deal with uh, uh, some of the key milestones here in more detail. But the point is that there's been a really, really complex evolution in the relationship between culture and the rest of the economy and the society. And uh, for a very long period of human history, for example, the very social role of the artist was not recognized as such, or even the identity of the artist as a single individual was not. 
And this is especially true for that part that uh, precedes what we will call culture 1.0 that has to do with spontaneous folk culture that is in some sense pervading even today a lot of what we do and how we think about culture. But this is really the part, probably the one of the most fascinating, but one in which I cannot really deal with at this moment because we don't have the time. Um, so basically the story starts from our point of view to the already crystallized basic model of relationship between culture and the economy that we could call culture 1.0, so the first fully fledged model in which the social role of the artist is recognized and that there is a specific way of uh, you know, voluntarily financing culture as such, which is the model of classical patronage that emerged in its full form and the, in some sense at the onset of the Roman Empire with Augustus. Hmm? Messinat is probably the most famous traditional patron of the history of culture. And uh, basically what Messinat did was inviting artists to his house and financing their work basically for his pleasure and the pleasure of his acquaintance. So this is the most simple and most classical fully-fledged model of support to the arts. What are the characteristics? First of all, um, the technological conditions for a real reproducibility of cultural contents are not there. So for example, Virgilius produces eglogs and poems for Messenat, but uh, the only way to circulate this is by copying them by hand, extremely expensive, extremely long, and basically, so the, almost the only way to be part of the story is to be part of the acquaintance of the, of the patron. So the audience is extremely limited, coincides basically with the social circle to which the patron belongs, and the patronage choices are determined by the tastes and the interests of the patron. So the patron decides on his own taste. Um, what are the purposes of the patron? Of course, spiritual cultivation, entertaining himself, and social promotion. There is a lot, of course, of positive social stigma that can be associated to successful patronage. And uh, economically speaking, culture is not here generating value added at all, is not creating value from the economic point of view. What it does is to absorb value that is produced elsewhere. You are a landlord, you are a merchant, you are a politician, you have all different means of, I mean, raising an income, and you use part of this income to patron the arts. The next stage, uh, which really brings an extremely important discontinuity, is what we can call strategic patronage that in its uh, most clear form belongs to the Italian Renaissance. Of course, it already started in a certain way in the Middle Ages, especially by church patronage, but the, the, real, the really you know, uh, full-fledged model really coincides with the Florence Medicis. Uh, and in particular here, the difference is that still the patron is an individual. But the target now is not just the patron acquaintances. Uh, there is a very far, f in some sense, far-reaching uh, consensus policy where uh, cultural patronage becomes part of the state affairs and uh, the patronage choices are strongly determined by ideological objectives. Uh, of course, the dialectics with the artists themselves can become very complicated, but the level of political entrepreneurship here is astounding. Just to make an example that is probably the textbook example of how this works, uh, you may have heard of the very interesting uh, story of how the vault of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence was built. So Santa Maria del Fiore was basically a, the hugest church in, in the city, but unfortunately the basic idea was that the vault had a radius that was not simply manageable with engineering knowledge of the time. So the embarrassing situation that emerged was that the church was built, but it could not be used because it rained inside. Because all, uh, in, the, in the radius of the vault, it was not possible to have a covering, a proper covering. At this point, this uh, young uh, and uh, extremely daring but also bizarre young engineer, uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, comes to Cosimo de' Medici and says, I can do it. Uh, I have an idea for the vault. 
can you imagine the level of political risk? There is a young emerging artist that is telling you that he wants to fix one of the biggest political problems that you have, and basically you have to trust him because uh, there's no check that he can work. The level of political entrepreneurship is here is so enormous that clearly if the vault wouldn't hold for the Medicis, this could have meant flying from the city. So can you imagine that today politicians are willing to run a risk for a political commissioning at this level? No way. So one of the reasons why the Renaissance has been so important is that it was really understood how a very visionary policy of cultural commissioning could change things politically. And this is the reason why the Renaissance is still for us a model. But uh, we really have to understand that the conditions were extremely, I mean, uh, interesting from the point of view of the logic of the relationship and the fact that the men of, men of state like Cosimo or like Lorenzo de' Medici were really talking to the artist was something that was part of their state activity. And again, make the comparison with today. Um, the next stage, which is basically the one that has shaped up our European conception of what a cultural policy is, is public patronage, that in its fullest form emerged after the French Revolution. What's the difference here? The difference is that now, culture really becomes part of the universal human rights. Hmm? So it's theoretically addressing everybody. Uh, practically, of course, is a bit more difficult. But now the idea is that the potential audience of culture is really everybody, is this the society. And uh, now the patron is no longer a person. The patron now is the state. So it's an impersonal subject. And the consequence of this is that now is not the taste of the patron that decides who can be financed and who cannot. But it's a system of abstract rules that are decided and impersonated by experts, by gatekeepers. So the public policies, as we know them today, are born with the public patronage model. And the consequence of this is that if you want to decide what kind of culture you should finance and what kind you shouldn't, you have to draw a distinction between high culture and low culture, culture that is deserving and culture that is not. This kind of distinction has shaped, in a fundamental way, the conception that the Europeans have about culture and about the social merits of culture. And we will see how important it is, this is when Europe has to adapt or not to adapt to the further changes that emerge. Um, there is, of course, a significant expansion of the audience. Culture attracts more and more resources. Huh? Uh, creates subtle problems of public finance because, of course, it's paid with public taxes, but generally the less educated profit less from, from culture. Uh, the access to highbrow culture itself becomes a sign of bourgeois distinction. Huh? So the stigma, the social stigma that is associated to sophisticated cultural taste now moves from the patron to the audience, so to speak. Okay, but then we are starting to face the first important transition. Something happens. What does it happen in practice? Well, the starting point of the new story, of the new cycle, is the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Because we know that with the Industrial Revolution, we have a huge urbanization process in Europe, where a lot of people abandon the countryside, they come to the city, the average income increases very quickly, the demands of people increase very quickly also in terms of what use they can make of the free time that they start to have as a consequence of the improved conditions. But the problem is that, uh, socially speaking so, there is a new, we will see, but a new way to thinking of culture as something that has to do with uh, emerging forms of mass consumption. The problem is that technology is not there yet. You, we cannot really do this. Just to make you an example about this. Um, for example, there is an enormous craving for novels huh? because uh, it's one of the simplest way to entertain people. But the problem is that still at the mid 19th century, books are enormously expensive for, for most people. So how artists and uh, economy cope with this technological uh, bottleneck. Oh, very simply, 
by selling a good uh, like a book as a durable good in installments. So what happens is that, for example, Charles Dickens writes the book and publish, publishes it chapter by chapter on the newspaper, relatively cheap. Huh? You can buy in installments and only the really rich people, when it becomes finally a book, buy the actual book. And this is still mid 19th century, which means that at that time, on average, the price of a book was the weekly wage of the average worker. So can you imagine? Hmm? Uh, the, real, the real technological revolution that makes this possible and leads to the creation of a modern cultural industry really happens at the turn between the 19th and the 20th century. And is the coincidence of an impressive series of technological innovation, modern printing techniques, radio, recorded music, photography, cinema, if you think of it, uh, they happen in the space of a half a generation. So it's extremely interesting how the transition comes about very quickly. And uh, however, the real problem is that the mentality of economic industrial development in Europe was created in the 19th century. In the 19th century, was culture industrialized? Nope. What's the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that in the mind of Europeans, culture has nothing to do with industry. Even when the technological conditions for industrial reproduction of contents became available, the mindset of Europeans was already so structured that basically it was impossible to bring the new picture into the frame. And in particular, Strange it may sound, the first systematic study carried out in Europe to measure the value added to the culture and creative industry was published in 2006. So, 100 years after the emergence of the cultural industrial revolution. But there was also another problem. And the problem was that Europe was solidifying this high bro low-bro dialectics of culture. And of course, the new culture and creative industry that was emerging with the new technologies was felt like a vulgar, popular culture. So, of course, from the point of view of the social stigma, it was fiercely adverse by the people that were the gatekeepers. Think of cinema. Huh? Initially, cinema was the object of a fierce prosecution, for example, by all the historians of the cultural tradition, because it was seen as a sordid spectacle where people were gathering in dark rooms doing God knows what during the projection of these vulgar moving images. Uh, not something so different from what's had, what has been happening in a few last decades for video games, by the way. Uh, so the problem is that this social stigma is very difficult to, to tackle. And as a consequence of this, the emergence of cultural and creative industry, which is the model of culture 2.0, found its way in the United States, which were the ideal place for this. First, because it was a young nation without a cultural tradition. Second, because as a consequence of this, they needed a new narrative. And third, because they had all the means to do this in particular an emerging young industry. And so all the models of proto-entertainment were developed in the United States. At the same time, the United States benefited largely from the flight of many creative talents from Europe due to the Nazi fascism, as we know. And by the way, the fact that the Nazi fascism used so, I mean, recklessly, mass communication to indoctrinate people was another stigma against the culture and creative industry. So Europe has become extremely suspicious of culture and creative industry for a very long time. And still today, if a cultural producer in Europe is too successful commercially, in some sense, he has to apologize or she has to apologize because it's becoming too easy, too popular, too simple. In some sense, something must be wrong. Whereas, as we know, it's exactly the contrary for uh, creative producers, I mean, being bred and growing professionally in the United States. Um, of course, here, there's no renegation of high bro versus low bro, but it is simply another way to considering, of considering the thing. And uh, 
quite flexibly, the emergent uh, cultural industry in the States absorbs all kinds of talent arriving from Europe. There is a gradual and finally dramatic expansion of the audience. There is a development of new business models. There is the emergence of the star system, the connection with the creative industry of communication, advertising, and so on. And you arrive at what we could call the golden standard of culture and creative industry, the model of mass entertainment that prevails in its purest form between the 40s and the 60s in the United States. And it's a model where you have now very large audiences, a global audience, basically, for these products. Um, you can reproduce content as much as you want. It's really unlimited. Uh, the turnover is so significant that, for example, California economy at the time was basically entirely depending on culture and creative industry, apart from a small uh, but significant farming industry. And, um, of course, this is part of the leisure economy. So, finally, we have culture that produces economic value, but this is a sector, a specific sector, and it is part of the entertainment economy. It needs intellectual protection, copyright. It is extremely important to appreciate the logical parallel between copyright and hybro lobro. Why? Okay, in hybro lobro, what determines what, where the money goes is the stigma of the gatekeepers. Huh? So, this is good, money. This is not good, no money. Um, what determines who gets the money for, from creative production in a culture and creative industry setting? Copyright. Who is entitled to the rights eh, of uh, intellectual and especially economic exploitation of this particular product? Um, we will see that exactly like the high bro low bro distinction so deeply ingrained in the European mentality, was the main obstacle for Europe to jump on a new bandwagon on culture and creative industry. So that was almost one century of delay of real, real commitment to it. This very thing, ingraining the business model into the copyright system, is what is preventing today the United States into jumping into the new bandwagon that has been created. And we will illustrate in a moment. And uh, also from this point of view, the fierce debate that is also in Europe about copyright protection law and evolution thereof, I think is, uh, is biased to some extent uh, by the non-complete understanding of what's going on in the evolution of this particular way of producing content. Um, the major form of culture and creative industry is what happens uh, starting from the late 60s, but of course already apparent in the mid 50s, which is the gradual takeover of the counterculture in Hollywood. The fact that new people arrive, uh, people like George Lucas, people like Francis Ford Coppola, people like Michael Cimino, just to make a few examples, that come from countercultures, that they have uh, a vision of culture that does not avoid conflict, is not something like Walt Disney cartoons, is something that creates controversy, that creates separate cultural universes where people can recognize themselves. And for example, the Star Wars paradigm, as we see still today, is a sort of handbook of how you can create a parallel countercultural world where people easily sit in and actively participate in creating part of this world. Because what is really interesting about countercultures is that in countercultures there are not audiences. Everybody in the small group is actually participating to the creation of the narrative. And this is exactly where we are now. What's emerging now that is making the paradigm of culture and creative industry very major, very quickly, and uh, unlike what many politicians think that uh, culture and creative industry are the latest trend, the new, the new thing to jump on, the reality is that uh, culture and creative industries are already extremely mature, and the new model is emerging very quickly, that we could call culture 3.0, that uh, as a social innovation part and a technological innovation part. The social innovation part I already illustrated. People, since the, le the 70s, begin to think that being part of the cultural game is not simply sitting quietly and observing what the others are doing, but participating to the action. This is the big social innovation. But the technological innovation that makes it possible 
to really participate in the cultural production game is the combination of two streams of technological innovation, digital production plus social media of second generation. Digital production, everybody today with this very laptop can set up a, for example, sound design studio with uh, an extremely reasonable investment financially and with an extremely reasonable learning investment in terms of how to use the software. So today, I mean, um, in the space of six months, if you are really talented and motivated, you can learn to use a state-of-the-art sound editing package that is basically the same that is used by professionals. Uh, the same is true for photography, the same is true for still moving images, whatever, huh? multimedia, name it. Um, the same technologies, let's say 15 years ago, would have cost enormously, were very bulky and needed an engineering degree to be used. At the same time, with social media of second generation, what you can do is basically to um, arrive exactly at the people that are interested in what you're doing. Think of SoundCloud, for example, for electronic music. You tag your track, you post your track on SoundCloud, and exactly the people that are interested in the sub-sub-genre you're working on will address exactly that content. The consequence of this is that we start to think in terms of complete, completely different paradigm because Moving from culture 1 to culture 2.0, what happens is that the audience expands dramatically. But the distinction between producers and users remains untouched. What happens now is that the distinction between producers and users of contents becomes blurred. Everybody is, depending on time and role, producer and user of contents. You need not take advantage or submit to market channels to do this. Because as we know very well, you can distribute your culture, not necessarily selling it. And uh, the economic and social value of culture is no longer produced just through price content, but it can, can be produced in a completely different way, and I will make an example in a second. Um, culture is infiltrating in a very, very interesting way, all kinds of different activities. So, whereas culture is a sector of the economy in Culture 2.0, culture becomes a sort of precondition of all kinds of narratives in Culture 3.0, in whatever kind of sector. And is no longer connected to free time only, because it enters massively into the daily fabric of life, huh? integrally. Uh, one could say, okay, very nice, but what you're saying so basically is that cultural professionals have finished their, their cycle and there will be an amateur economy? Not at all. It, exactly like, I mean, in a situation whereby everybody learns to dance, professional dancers have nothing to do, no, they have much more to do. <laughs> because of course people now know the difference between a good dancer and not so good dancer. So they can really appreciate, and uh, the value that they can attach to this is enormously bigger. So, in fact, for cultural professionals, finding themselves in an ecology in which all people are producing contents creates an enormous amount of new possibilities and professional development opportunities. So it's very important to understand that this way of reasoning is not killing at all the role of cultural professionals or of cultural institutions but is rethinking the role and the mission of these institutions for an economy in which people are not passive, which is good news. Uh, in particular, how can culture produce value outside the market conditions? Because today, for example, for museum uh, directors, one of the obsession is, okay, but how much revenue do you generate? Huh? So what the decision makers want to know is, okay, how about money? Huh? And it seems that the only way to justify your existence is to prove that you are producing streams of revenues. This is culture 2.0. What's happening today is that we know, for example, just to make an example, but a dramatic one, that there is a very strong relationship between cultural production, active cultural participation, and subjective well-being. In particular, people who have an active pattern of participation 
are much better in terms of their perception of well-being. The next step is that improvements in the perception of well-being are proved today to have an impact which is substantial on very measurable and very critical parameters like hospitalization rates, for example, for the elderly. So, I mean, it, it's sufficient that you cut by 5% and it is an extremely prudent estimate. The welfare bill from, uh, for example, the 70 plus age cohort by active cultural participation that you generate a macroeconomic impact that is bigger than the turnover of the culture and creative industry. And you are not selling anything. You are in simply and, uh, you know, plainly inviting people to participate. So can you imagine how can this impact the future sustainability of welfare systems if we start thinking of cultural policy as strictly complementary to innovation policy and to health policy? And I will make a quick example later when I speak of, uh, of turnovers. Okay, but what lies ahead? What will happen in the future? We are just at the beginning of this new paradigm. So even if things are moving quickly, it's reasonable to think where we are heading. And it's interesting that today, the, the players that are benefiting the most of this new situation are especially big players like uh, the big four, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google. I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's apparent that uh, Apple, of course, uh, it's apparent that, they, I mean, they are providing us with the platforms, with the, with the, with the models with which we actually shape up these new ways of cultural production. But economically speaking, these are very traditional profit maximizing firms that have nothing really different from firms from the beginning of the 20th century. Then the problem is, will people be willing, willingly giving away their information, their personal characteristics, their contents, once they have really learned the nature of the game? Now they are happy because they say, OK, I have Facebook for free. Well, but when you understand really what's the nature of the exchange, you understand that not only this for, is not for free, but you're giving away an enormous amount of value even without noticing it. Will people be, able, will people be willing to do this 10 years from now? Unlikely. So this means that we will face a new turn in which probably also the industrial organization of this emerging, booming content economy will be deeply affected. And it will be extremely important at that time that the level of economic democracy of active citizenship is strong enough for people to pressure to have a model that not, does, does, not simply, does not simply adapt to the needs of the giants. Because you know already, for example, in the debate about net neutrality, that these people are trying to control the new economy much more than states themselves can do. So, I mean, the scenario that we have in front of us is extremely complex and extremely multifaceted. Uh, but what is clearly emerging already is that uh, we are facing a culturalization of the economy. In the culture 3.0 situation, basically all sources of value are deeply linked to narratives because people simply are not interested in passively buying goods and services today. They want to build narratives because they are culture 3.0 people. They, they, they produce contents all the time. A, for example, I will never, never be really interested in, I mean, not everybody, but most people will never be interested, for example, in a holiday if they don't have the possibility to document this holiday and to share the experience with the other people where, which are not there. Not necessarily because they want to show off, but because narrating the experience is part of the experience itself. So with this kind of people, you cannot really think that you can generate value without leveraging upon this dimension. Huh? Um, and as a consequence of this, one of the key issues of cultural policies becomes massive capability building. We have to enable people to be able to participate in the game more and more without necessarily, as I said, overcoming uh, cultural professionals without bypassing cultural institutions, but having cultural professions and cultural institutions as new allies in a totally different kind of game in which the more solid and widespread the capability base is, the more an economy or a region is really able to tap into the new opportunities. And uh, 
In particular, the problem is, can we really include everybody? And this is the problem. Because only a truly inclusive platform, from this point of view, is socially sustainable. And we will see this in a moment. Uh, in terms of cultural policy design, of course, there are new challenges that are open. Um, of course, uh, we can now reason on the social and economic impact of culture, not just in terms of turnover. If I can show that a museum systematically improves uh, the well-being of the resident population, and if I find the right way to properly measure this, this is an extremely strong argument, and not incidentally, for example, the European Commission is now launching major projects to start defining new cultural indicators to measure this. Um, and by the way, I don't have to do this by turning upside down the mission of the museum. I simply have to do this by deepening the mission of the museum and being aware of these possibilities. So it's really something that is not instrumentalizing cultural production and cultural experiences, but is giving deeper meaning and more awareness of the real, already existing consequences of cultural participation. And uh, participation to policy design is fundamental. You cannot do policy design for culture in your studio. You really have to interact with the population, with the resident people. We will see in a moment uh, some aspects of this. And uh, cities and communities today can really be laboratories for this. The real, the real nature of the game now is which are the regions that can really show the way by concretely exploring and concretely implementing the new possibilities. And especially in Europe, this game, the next few years, will have enormous payoffs for who is able to provide real examples. So let's go into one of the two practical lines uh, that I'm interested in pointing out today, which is crossovers. Crossovers and innovation. Um, we know already that crossovers are becoming the trend in an innovation-driven economy. And basically, you have several ways to, to implement is useful crossovers. You can mix technology within a sector. So for example, within the cultural sector, you can have mixes of technology. But you can apply technology developed in one sector in another sector. You can lay a bridge between different sectors. And you can rebuild completely the platform for certain types of purposes. Um, of course, in the European smart specialization strategy, crossovers are fundamental and also this uh, need to have a bottom-up drive in finding out the right mix of smart specializations for a region is absolutely emphasized. And of course, culture is an ideal platform for crossovers because it's all about that. And in particular, Culture 3.0 is about crossovers. And from this point of view, it's interesting to appreciate the difference with Culture 1 and 2.0. So in Culture 1.0, basically, you pride yourself that you are isolated from the rest. Culture is the ivory tower. So not only I am not interested in the relationship between culture and the economy, but I don't want to have relationships with the economy because I think that this is polluting, in some sense, the pureness of the cultural experience. In Culture 2.0, you do want to pollute yourself with the economy, but you are a sector of the economy and you reason as a sector. In the new situation, you are really a social learning platform, as Culture 3.0, that interacts with everything, and by interacting with everything, find an incredible amount of new inspiration on how to work on the expanding the frontier of what cultural production of meaning is. And of course, in terms of forms of crossovers, Culture works in all the four ways that we previously described with a variety of different channels. By building capabilities, by producing and remixing contents, by redesigning forms of interaction, by harnessing diversity, the role of culture in intercultural dialogue, active intercultural dialogue in modern societies, of course, can hardly be uh, overemphasized. And of course, this changes the logic of clustering. Um, today, we see that the really interesting regional laboratories are not longer those in which you have a hard, single-minded specialization, like, you know, the cluster of mechanics, the cluster of shoemaking, the cluster of whatever. Today, what's happening is that 
the very role of Culture 3.0 as a crossover generator is creating clusters where you have completely different companies producing completely different kinds of things and services, but with a common commitment towards radical innovation. So the, it, the, the real clustering factor today is the way to innovate rather than what you do. So from this point of view, we are seeing the emergence of a completely different pattern of smart specialization. And by the way, the already nominated big four are all massively, massively leveraging upon cultural content production or distribution as key elements of their business models. With all the limitations that I already discussed, uh, it's not sustainable in the long term as it is now, but it's interesting that the fastest growing and the most influential companies of today are all into this. So let's examine in some more detail examples, concrete examples of crossovers, type one within the cultural sector. One of the most exciting future elements here is digital heritage, combining the use of digital platforms for, with the experience of narrating the, average, the heritage and uh, entering into the spirit of the heritage, and in some sense, renovating the heritage, because the heritage of tomorrow will be very multifaceted and extremely complex if compared to the heritage of today. The massive amount of production of content that everybody contributes today is changing, for example, the order of magnitude, think of how many images are produced today. Okay, you could say, okay, most of these images are not interesting at all. Everybody takes today, let's say, 100 images per day, but most of them are not even interested in for the people who take them. True, but at the same time, this changes completely the way in which we manage this body of things. And for example, these things that are not significant for us could probably be significant for historians when they will try to understand what this period was. So. With this level, for example, of imagery, such that in the last couple of years we have produced the same amount of images that we produced since the invention of photography, and this is going to accelerate dramatically in the next few years. Of course, the, all these forms of curatorship, of selection, of uh, high-bro gatekeeping will be deeply influenced by this. Digital heritage is a frontier for this, at the same time, digital heritage is a way to reanimate dramatically physical heritage. So, for example, in Siena, as I mentioned, I was working for the Culture Capital B 2019. You know that Siena is a UNESCO city. And uh, the project that we developed for Siena that we will probably carry out no matter what, even without a title, is to transform Siena into the first digital, integrally, integrally covered, uh, beaconized digital heritage uh, uh, space in Europe, where you can really have the possibility of building up narratives of dialogue with this fantastic built heritage that there is there, in ways in which you not simply have a, a totally different way of accessing the information to read this heritage, but to contribute to the narrative of this heritage. So this is the frontier, as it is the creative placemaking that has to do with, for example, urban renewal, where performing arts and visual arts integrally become part of the transformation process, another exciting form of internal crossover, and of course, gamified forms of communication that are becoming standard currency. And um, in terms of movements of technology to and from the cultural sphere, of course, educational serious gaming is becoming big. So you basically take technologies that come from the game design, so cultural industry, and you move them into the ed educational sector to train new surgeons or to train new pilots or, I mean, whatever. And um, you, can, you can even use this for urban design, like the case of SimCity here shows in the, in the, in the slide. There, there are, of course, the 3D and 4D movie standards, which are changing, revolutionizing so many different industries at the moment, including mechatronics, um, augmented reality, of course, or on the other side, parallel computing invented in science fields that are being used now in music or in, in visual design and so on and so forth. And then bridges between sectors. Uh, I already mentioned culture and health. What you see here is the cover of uh, one of the fall 2013 uh, nature issues in which there was the first publication of the first systematic study in which game, 
design was used to treat Alzheimer patients. So for the first time, we were able to design a gamified learning environment for Alzheimer patients that by playing video games, significantly slow down their cognitive decay. This is end of 2013, it's already history, because now, one year and a half after, the, the knowledge on this is progressing spectacularly, and for example, ICT and active aging is becoming a hot uh, topic of research. Not incidentally, the Commission has just closed the call for this for 100 million euros for new models of ICT and active aging, just to give you an idea of the size of the thing. Um, of course, this is, there are interesting relationships with the green economy, with the sharing economy, and to finish this, of course, there are the crossovers that completely reshape the panorama. For example, the relationship with innovation. We know today that uh, innovative uh, attitudes are deeply influenced by the level of cultural participation because the more people are actively participating, the more they tend to train themselves to face what's unfamiliar, to face what's disturbing. And so, of course, when you're in your normal professional capacity, even if it's outside culture, you have trained to do this, it becomes much easier to be conducive of innovation, uh, uh, innovating projects rather than obstacling them. Um, but we need still to know a lot about this. Of course, uh, the effects of cultural capability building on educational performance today are well studied and very well known. Uh, social cohesion, for example, we know from things like El Sistema, developed in Venezuela starting from the 90s. We know today that there is the real possibility through, for example, education in classical music training to change completely the attitudes of people coming from seriously dysfunctional social settings, belonging to ga juvenile gangs that turn into serious professionals or accomplished musicians, but not necessarily musicians, through this kind of education. So, I mean, this is the, the level where you can really reprogram re substantially uh, some serious critical issues through cultural policy. So, the question becomes, but why so culture matters so little at the European level at the moment? Culture is not in the seven flagship projects of Europe 2020, or better, is not on the front of them, any of them, and is not on the front of any of the 11 thematic objectives of the uh, cohesion policy. The reason is that policymakers have a lot of difficulty of appreciating what we have been saying so far. They are basically thinking of culture in the best case in terms of culture 2.0, and the most cases are culture 1.0. So basically, culture needs money, period. And this is not very attractive for many politicians. Um, so the point is that, uh, of course, this is a moment in which serious regional experimentation can make the difference. And not incidentally, as I said, there is an increasing amount of attention, both at the community level and the national levels, for providing examples that work, that they can really implement the new paradigm. So, in the last 10 minutes, I would uh, insist on the other aspect that I think is extremely important as well, which is participation. And we will see how this connects somewhat unexpectedly to what Christa then has to say on the, on the second part, on the actual implementation of this model in the Swedish regions that we have been working on so far. Participation, of course, has evolved a lot in terms of the three paradigms that we have been discussing. Of course, in terms of culture 1.0, participation is just cooptation. If you happen to be part of the social circle, you participate, otherwise you don't. Uh, participation through culture 2.0 thing needs basically money. Eh? If you don't have money to buy the products, you don't participate. Um, but in Culture 3.0, interestingly, participation is really community affiliation, so the barriers to participation practically break down completely. But the point is that we have to understand how the socioeconomic effects of cultural participation can really be, in some sense, uh, fully, fully deployed. Um, and these new paradigms, it's interesting to stress once again, do not necessarily use the markets, and uh, communities of practice become a new, interesting, alternative paradigm that we know already in culture is being used and experimented with a lot of success. The problem is that participation is not so easy, and in particular, the ones who participate easily are the ones who need it the less. Because the people who are more educated, 
the people who are already strongly socialized, of course, they participate. When there are public meetings, they are able to speak their mind, to argue convincingly. But the point is that the people who don't are exactly the people they should include. And the problem is how you bring these people in, knowing that these are exactly the people that need it, but probably are also exactly the people that will shy away from it. And by the way, a cross-examination of the literature, or recent literature of participation, confirms this fully. Huh? There is a huge problem of participation from this point of view. Uh, the problem has been uh, a bit uh, complicated by the fact that, uh, as you know, there has been this dramatic success of the paradigm of a creative class by Richard Florida that has informed heavily cultural policy design in the recent past in many places. The problem is that the creative class creates a dual conception huh, of the development in its relationship to culture and creativity. And basically it's the duality between the creatives and the non-creatives. If you reflect on what we have just said, we are saying that basically the real issue is bringing everybody in. So in a situation in which the social and technological momentum brings everybody into the game, thinking in dual terms is basically jeopardizing the thing. And especially if we think of the fact that the very notion of creative class is extremely difficult to define, technically speaking. Sociologically, it's very difficult to argue that a creative class is a class in the first place. So as a consequence of this, un involuntarily, eh, because that was not the purpose, but for example, the creative class approach has sometimes exasperated the dualism and created, for example, problematic examples of gentrification. For example, the application in Baltimore that has been documented in a few field studies. It's very, very telling in this sense. And of course, the problem is that if politicians tend to think that the only thing that is there is just to have this uh, very spectacular effects of culture-driven development uh, through a creative class mechanism, this instrumentalizes deeply the role of culture, which is exactly the opposite of what we are trying to argue here. The point is that it's the other way around. Everybody is part of this community of practice. Everybody must be part of this community of practice. So the real issue becomes not, uh, I mean, tailoring urban design or cultural policies to the needs of this cultural elite. On the contrary, it is empowering everybody to participate. And in particular, the people who are less apparently entitled to do this. And uh, of course, this changes completely the way in which creative professionals themselves can help and can be important in this, also in developing new professional opportunities in completely new ways. Think, for example, of the emerging possible professional opportunities in this new relationship between culture and health, which is not creating simply, let's say, cultural nurses, no, but it's really working very creatively on forms of cultural participation with a very important creative impact, which are at the same time deeply involving people with all sorts of health problems. So the point is, why in the community for this kind of change? Um, and this, uh, of course, requires, um, <laughs> again, rethinking old instruments. There is a lot of uh, buzz about storytelling today, but most of this buzz has to do with cheap marketing uh, solutions. But storytelling is something that is much more deeply ingrained into human cultures. It's something that has a very long and extremely complex story. So I don't have the time to elaborate on this, but social storytelling can be really used to empower everybody because everybody is culturally empowered already to participate in story making and appreciation, whatever the educational level of people. So interestingly, there are today experiments in participation that make you very creative use of community storytelling. And for example, can use community storytelling even if people with no technical training can be involved in scenario analysis, cost-benefit analysis in completely different ways by using very creatively storytelling as a tool of active citizenship. The second point is uh, community informatics and civic hacking. 
that is becoming an extremely interesting field for new research. And again, there are very, very interesting projects in which you empower completely marginal communities through civic hacking, like, for example, in turning uh, abandoned, uh, abandoned telephone stalls into micro libraries, for example, in neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. Um, relational public art, you can really use public art as a way to construct together with the local community completely different things, which are not necessarily have to be evaluated in terms of the formal, uh, you know, uh, characteristics of the object, but it really have to do with the process and the fact that the process can leave a lasting impact. And so the, the real object of the artistic operation in this case is the relation rather than the object that's itself. For example, this uh, is an example of a very interesting project that was created in Catania in one of the most critical um, dysfunctional areas of Sicily in Italy with the collaboration of some uh, public artists that completely involved the local community in in, in a situation where in most families at least one member of the family was in prison because of links to the mafia that created a completely new way of redefining the identity of the quarter that was a sort of no man's land, a sort of Bronx that became in some sense, this, this, this thing is called the, the, the port, the, the, the door of beauty and it's really a way to rethink the community in a totally different way and making of them the custodians of the work of art, and not simply the authors. So, I mean, very complex and interesting processes. And this means that if we combine properly today social storytelling, community informatics, and relational art projects, we can really create a new toolbox for active forms of participation where all cultural professionals can find a very interesting, and institutions can find a very interesting way to work together a collective strategy for cultural policy design which is truly inclusive. And um, so participation and policy design come to be linked in a very interesting way. The problem is that, you know, uh, culture 3.0 is something very new. Even if it's happening just before our eyes, it's so recent. So, in most cases, what happens is that people tend to focus on more familiar models. So, policies today tend to be focused on culture and creative industry or to traditional ways of thinking of forms of patronage as if they were the only alternatives. So, the point is that we have to not that we have to exclude these things. Eh? I, I would not like to give the message that, for example, patronage today is not relevant anymore. It's not true. There are forms of cultural production that need patronage. Museums need some form of patronage, for example, public patronage. Um, the performing arts, the visual arts need patronage. Of course, markets are important, and in some cases, copyright is important. But the point is that, is this the picture or is this part of the picture? The point is that it is part of the picture, and uh, there is a bigger and bigger part of the picture that has to do with something else. So the real problem is how we can ingrain these new possibilities into a new approach to cultural policy design. And especially community participation is where the real disruptive innovation lies. And especially if we want to go for long-term effects of what we are doing, prioritizing inclusive participation becomes the number one emergency. And to conclude, um, of course, we cannot expect, for example, that uh, now, today, suddenly Europe thinks that culture becomes a priority item in the policy agenda. It will take time. But what is needed today is to work out that moment of experimentation that is needed for this to become a priority item in the next policy cycle in Europe, starting from 2021. So today, the real name of the game is developing local laboratories that work. And this can be, as I said, extremely advantageous in many respects, especially if uh, we devise new forms of culture-driven smart specialization, where participation makes the difference, and of course, the regions in Europe that have especially interesting characteristics in this respect, are probably the ones that have the responsibility to work for this. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why 
I am so focusing on Sweden now, because as I said at the beginning of my talk, uh, I think that here, for example, much more than in Italy, certain conditions are there. Uh, we also have to understand that there are other countries which are move, or other regions that are moving very quickly towards this new paradigm. For example, I didn't have the time to explain, but uh, I mean, as I said, the United States are not really tapping into culture 3.0 because they have too much to lose from the dismantling of the centrality of culture and creative industry. But who's profiting? The answer is especially the Far East, and in this moment, the number one player is South Korea that is becoming very quickly a global content leader by developing business models that have nothing to do with copyright. So I don't have the time to explore this, but this really means that Europe huh, has an opportunity, but also has to move quickly, because I mean, the, 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 there is a global shift from this point of view, and it's, not, it's far from granted that Europe will be a global player in this particular respect, if the opportunities are not tapped into. So it's very important that um, we go for real experimentation. What we have started to do in Sweden is exactly this. And now for this, I give the floor to Christer. Uh, before doing this, I just thank you so much for, for your attention in this long presentation. Uh, at the same time, I would like to stress that anybody who is interested in having a closer interaction on some specific aspects, Okay, here is my email. I regularly post contents on both Facebook and Twitter that have to do with this specific paradigm because as you can imagine today, there is an incredible wealth of experiences and studies and things that just build on this particular perspective. So uh, everybody is invited in a very 3.0 way to participate in this. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Pierre Luigi, Sacco. And of course, there will be possibilities to ask you questions, but um, uh, we will do it after my speech here. Um, so <coughs> see if I can open up my yeah. presentation. Just go on. Eh? The next slide should be. Is it like this? Yes. Excellent. No? Yes. Here it is. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, very in interactive, yes. Thank you. Um, so, um, what we heard now is the um, theoretical understanding of the new role for culture in, in the post-industrial society. Um, what we've been doing for the last, um, I don't know, five, ten years or something, is to see if we can start an, a, a regional understanding of this. You can say that from a, from a macro level, which you, you talked about here, uh, and also, you didn't mention your your um, evidence-based research, which mostly goes to, to the European statistics. And uh, one of the interesting um, uh, research you did was when you compare the the statistics for innovation compared to the statistics for cultural participation. And you can see that it was more or less the same uh, countries that um, uh, had the same position in this ranking. So number one course, since listen to you, was Sweden that has the, was the number one when it comes to innovation, but also when it comes to number one with the culture participation. But what maybe you were more interested in Italy, that was underneath or below the, the average uh, level of Europe. And it was also together with this uh, financial countries, uh, financial crisis countries as, uh, as Portugal uh, and Greece and so on. But <coughs> so going from there to understand it on a macro level, then there was a lot of studies do, um, to, to investigate culture's impact on, on uh, enterprise level for, for, for organizations, mainly in, in um, bigger um, corporations. Uh, and today everybody knows that the Google and Facebook and the com uh, companies you mentioned has a program for increasing the creativity in, inside the offices. And they have the spaces to meet and to do whatever they want to do, etc. So there are <coughs> a lot of research also on 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 the, on the uh, more or less the, the floor level, so to say. What are the enterprises doing in this uh, in this sense? So what we were interested in to see what is between this. What can we understand from a regional level? Is it like a a, 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 um, a territory, a, a geographical territory? that could also have this kind of uh, understanding and can we find new models, m new methods, n new policy or new policy making to, to increase the um, um, participation in culture to see of, uh, if we also can have a um, higher 
uh, impact of, of new ideas and uh, innovation, and also if we can have a, a better return of, of the tax money invested in, in different kind of activities. So can we actually see if we can develop a region in a sustainable way with this kind of approach? So this is what we started a couple of years ago, and um, first we we did it in in the region where I was working at the time in Halland. But the interesting thing when we, we go to this is to 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 do some actions. The same, you, we need to in, to understand the landscape where the policy makers and the decision makers are taking. So where are they actually doing their job, so to say, and why are they doing this job? So the first question we had is to understand where are actually decisions made, and by whom, and also why. So, <coughs> because so far, I don't know any successful p political party that has as, as a number one question to, to have the culture 3.0 yet, or even the culture policy party. Um, it might be some heritage uh, political party, but I, I will not speak about them today. But. Most of the political parties has, uh, let's say, another background. They have other values, another value ground. And <coughs> but um, being in this business for a couple of decades now, I think that I understand what are the most interesting question for for the poli politi politicians today. And you can say, if you go to the global level, we have these three challenges that we've been working with for the last um, two or three decades now. And you can express them in this way. This is a United Nation that, um, that um, um, uh, Habitat, UN Habitat in Vancouver, actually. Um, so, <coughs> so you can see that there is a, this overall challenges for, for the whole globe, so to say. And everybody has know the political answer to this. It is sustainable development. And sustainable development has been the objective for the last, uh, I don't know, two, two decades, probably. But <coughs> besides that, we can see uh, other challenges or other megatrends. And we can speak about more and more people are moving to the cities today. And you spoke about the, the, the new ITC, ICT uh, society or knowledge society. And, but we also very clearly can see um, another aspect, and this is the non-sectorial society. The non-sectorial society is what the European Commission said. And, <coughs> and today, um, and um, we can also hear what PLD Sacco talked about, the crossover effects and so on. So it is not just a sector anymore that had to face its own problems, so to say. More and more um, successful projects are more what we can call multi-problem oriented. They try to involve more kind of problems. And just now we listened to PLD Sacco that could see that culture affects many different uh, angles. But this also means that to design such a policy on, on a regional level, you have to be aware of these other problems, so to say. Or we can speak about needs. What are the regional needs? How can our produce, so to say, can be a, a part of this? If you go to, to, to Europe or to Brussels, you can say that, uh, um, <coughs> that today, when we express sustainable development in, in Brussels, you speak about smart, inclusive and sustainable growth. Or um, if you say so, we can speak about inclusiveness, sustainability, and innovation. Innovation-driven economy. So, <coughs> so that is, um, let's say, the political approach. But one more time, my experience is when you close the door and start to negotiate with the, the political leadership, it is more or less, after a while, boiled down to one specific question, and that is job creation. So this is more or less everything starting point when it comes to policy. So if you not can clarify it, that what you're doing for your job creation processes, it's very difficult to get um, any reflection or any, what we speak about here, also the, and the budget, so to say. You have to, to prove it. Even if you have another value or a, a value ground or starting point, this is where the decision in the end are taken. And if you speak to a policymaker or a polit politician, um, I think the, their logic say that the job creation process starts with an economic growth. So we have to understand how we can make um, 
to create new jobs, which in the future will be the possibility to, to have an income, which we can pay tax on, which can go to the health and uh, taking care of elderly people and, and also schools and, and maybe sometimes also public culture. So this is the starting point uh, and this is uh, one more time my experience. But this is also interesting because if you see about the body that are working within this uh, uh, context, so to say, it's very obvious that it <coughs> today um, it is more and more <coughs> a new, maybe not longer a, a new one, but it has been more and more clear that we have a stronger part that are working on the regional level. Or uh, maybe in, in, in a globalized situation, it's an urban agglomeration level. But today, it's obvious also that these regions are competing with each other. And that is very interesting in this concept, because we have to understand that it's not uh, you know, nations so much anymore. It is regions competing with regions. So that is the question also, what are they competing about? So just have, think about it. What are all regions are competing about? And you can say that it's more or less people. So what they start today with is compete to attract people to move to your region. And in Sweden, they means that they pay this tech, uh, local tax money. Or <coughs> as we heard before, that you can start <coughs> with uh, also to start new innovative things together. So it's about attracting people, attracting investors, attracting um, uh, also visitors, but mostly to, to, to people to come and, and stay in your region, to start new things. So if you continue this journey through Europe, you can say that on the European level, there is a standard um, um, strategy for this. And today it's called Smart Specialization Strategies, which Pierluigi Sacco just mentioned here. And Smart Specialization Strategies is actually uh, a key word for regional development on a European level. And <coughs> it goes back to the uh, budget period for starting from 2014, so it's a rather new concept. Um, but still, I think all regions in Europe are working with this. They can call it something else. Sometimes still it's called regional um, development strategies or something about that. But the thing is that it's today it has a very clear strategy or clear objectives. So it starts more and more working from what the region is very good at and to develop the big things, so to say. So <coughs> it starts with their own region's assets and also their own region's people and also their own people's capability to, to learn, so to say, and also to develop new things. So it's, it's, it's in this sense, it's regional based. So what we try to understand is what is a region's really true assets? So what are the assets in terms of tangible assets, but also what we heard before about the intangible assets or intangible values, which can be more developed or even maybe produced. So, um, so, <coughs> so what are, if we speak about culture in this sense and see what are the culture strategies, we can say that um, you, you mentioned this report from 2006 and um, that changed uh, the European way, and um, <coughs> I think the most of you here knows about this uh, Kia report from 2006 that was, um, I can say, dramatically changed the whole culture policies in Europe. Because as Pierre de Sacco just said, it uh, made Europe wake up to understand the new role of culture. So you can say that uh, what it said was uh, that it compared different kind of industries uh, in, in Europe. And it was also very clear from this report that uh, Europe was not just uh, a, a region in the industrial age anymore. It was taking a step into the knowledge economy, whatever you call it, or post-industrial economy. It said that the annual turnover for car production in Europe was, I think it was 271 billion Europe. It doesn't matter, it was 2001 or 2003. But the chemical industry was more or less the same. It was also 2001 or 2003. And the ICT sector, which everybody knows was a new emerging sector, new emerging industry, which will be the future, it was as these two old sectors together. So it was like five, four, four billion euros, which is a lot of money and we don't need to understand them. But the interesting thing was this Kia report was investigated an annual turnover for, for culture. 
And everybody was really surprised because it was not 271 billion euros, it was not 273 billion euros, and it was not like the ICT sector, 544 billion euros, it was 654 billion euros. So suddenly everybody saw these figures and understood that this is a lot of money. But also it is a lot of jobs. So it said that 3% of the, um, the people in Europe were working in the culture industries. So that needs um, <coughs> also an understanding from European level that we need a new culture policy. It's not enough for the regions or for a national government to decide on the culture policy because it's so important. It's even twice as important for as, as car production. So now EU started with this new um, agenda for culture. And after a while, also uh, the several countries, nations started the same process. And in Sweden, we had this new culture policy from a couple of years ago, and it's called Kultursamverkansmodellen in Swedish. Um, and um, it's based on regional culture uh, plans, or Kulturplanen. So <coughs> even on the regional level, it changed the whole. So we have a, now a strategy how, how to understand culture and also improve it, but it's also a lot of see how culture can uh, work stronger together. Different kind of culture actors can work strong, stronger together. But the interesting thing was also that <coughs> we have other regional documents. So we have, for instance, an action plan for culture and creative industries today. And we are in most of the regions, we also have an innovation strategy. And all these, we can say, are boiled down to this regional development strategy, this smart specialist strategy. So this is the key document to act now, today, if you're going to make some changes and if you're going to implement the culture policy. So <coughs> what are the opportunities there? Yes, you, of course, you have the, um, the, the public money and the public resources based on tax money, but uh, you can also have some European money or EU money. And um, maybe you know about the EU budget here, but if, if you don't know about the EU budget, I can tell you <laughs> what it looks like. It's 50% of the EU budget is agriculture, and one third is regional development. So what it is, it's a competition of the regional development money, which are quite a lot of money. And um, in this regional development money, or the structural funds, as they are called, there are uh, there used to be opportunities for culture projects. So many of the culture activities or organizations you see here in, in Visby in Gotland are financed by the European money. And they are based on either interreg or whatever you call it, but it is structural fund money, which means that it's very important how, uh, what are the strategies for, for, for the structural funds. And today they were changed, or uh, last year they were changed. So, <coughs> so today, there are three objectives for, this, for the structural funds, and they say it's, it's about technical innovation, it is about SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, and it is about re reduction of CO2. So culture is not mentioned anymore. It used to be there for two periods, but it's not mentioned anymore. So that means that you have to understand, you have to express what you're going to do if you're going to work with culture or develop a, um, some culture activities, and you want to have money from the structural funds, you need to find another way to express it. You need, you need to find another way to design the project, and this is what the what, uh, decision maker decision said. So it's about the technical innovation one more time, and, and um, SMEs, and, uh, and um, uh, reduction of CO2s. So, <coughs> so what we, we tried to do was to see how can culture activities fit into this system? How can culture be part of the regional development system? Can we actually understand uh, how we can develop culture activities so it also is, are understandable for the decision makers and the policy makers? So we started, as I said a couple of years ago, a project we called the Fields of Creative Power. Um, where we try to understand a regional's assets and how it fit into this system. So, and um, Pierluigi Sacco and his colleagues in, in Italy started it actually in Veneto, as you mentioned. And I think it's very easy to understand. I mean, I'm, come on, I'm, we, we're working with culture and we know where culture has the biggest effect. I mean, everybody here knows about uh, Gotland, don't you? 
I mean, everybody knows where are the most important places in, in Gotland or in Visby. And we can also see the relation between your culture activities and the business and the regional development and the sustainable development and everything. It is very obvious, of course. So it is the same in Venice. I mean, come on, how, ma how many of you have been to Venice? Two, three, <laughs> okay, most of you. So you know what Venice looks like. And you also know that you were not alone. Because there are many people in, in, in Venice. I mean, how many are they? I don't know. But they are 20 million per year. So are there 20 million inhabitants? No. It used to be 200,000 inhabitants, and now I think it's down to 50 or something. But the interesting thing is, they are tourists. Visitors coming to this region for one purpose. And this purpose you can call cultural heritage experience. That is the framework, anyway. So <coughs> look at, take a look at the understanding on, on, um, on um, the culture in, in Veneto region. So first, what uh, the colleagues in Italy did was to map all cultural activities. So what does it look like? Where are the museums? And I help you. This is Veneto, this is water, this is Venice. OK? Museums, Venice. Built. Heritage, historic buildings, Venice. Libraries, archives. <laughs> Education, Venice. And then my favorite, performing arts, Verona. <laughs> and yesterday, we, had, we, we did this in Stockholm yesterday, and I, I need to tell you. Uh, how many of you have seen Monty Python? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen this? The large, the large, the large, the horse chestnut. <laughs> and it was like this. Sorry, um, I go back to the serious part now. So <clears throat> the interesting thing here was that you can see that all cultures are, you can find in Venice. And we speak about culture-led regional development policies. Of course, if you're going to invest, if you're going to develop Veneto, if you're going to make Veneto a better place to live in, of course you have to invest in culture, and it's obvious where you're going to have the biggest effect, isn't it? Venice. No, it was not so easy. So, <coughs> sorry for a very bad slide now, but what Piero G. Sacco developed with his colleague was to see it and how to understand the, what you talked about before and how you can understand it in a regional context. So what they were doing was to in, in make this mapping of each culture activities. But you also were studying the relation to other socioeconomic um, statistics and databases. So they can see <coughs> where, if you combined it, and also if you used uh, in, 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 um, a model, which, which we are going to present a little bit later, there were a possibility to understand where are the best opportunities for cultural and uh, regional development. So wh where are the soil, and if I speak Swedish, I normally say, where is the best mylla? Where is the soil the best? Where and actually a new idea can be grown to something new and something uh, that could help the region to be more developed. So this is where the map where, where they show the results. So this is one more time the water. And here we have Padova, and here we have Verona, and here we have something else. But remember what we were looking for. We were looking for Venice. Venice. And Venice is just the water. So what was happening here? We saw it, I mean, in, in traditional mapping, it was very obvious it was Venice. And now we cannot find it. So I think this is extremely interesting. And I just want to, you to think about one thing. If this is Visby, and we want to increase just the tourist, as is the Venice our objective? Is what, what we want Ven uh, Visby to be a new Venice, with 20 million visitors coming every year? Well, this is the opportunities for sustainable development. This is opportunities for sustainable economic development or regional development. No, the, here are the parts which are most interesting in, in the Veneto region. Here are the parts that has the biggest possibility for 
regional development, for economic growth, for job creation. Here are the, where the culture has the biggest impact on the, the local uh, enterprises, let's say. And here <coughs> you can find today many, a number of very famous companies. I will just mention uh, Bianchi Bicycles and Diesel Jeans here. But the interesting thing is why can we not see uh, uh, Venice? Well, we can say it's, it depends on two or, two or three things, and I will mention a couple of them here. One is it's no people living there anymore. So even if they have the best art exhibition, the best film festival, f film festival you invite the top level of creative people or, or artists or in, in, innovators or whatever, and you have ten, 20 million of, of tourists coming, a lot of new ideas are born here but they're going back to their original place. So you can sit there and have a fantastic new idea or a fantastic new idea, but it goes back to Bangladesh or Bosta, or I don't know. <laughs> so what's happening here is you don't have people and you don't have this soil, you don't have this mylla. So no people can develop this idea, but you find the linkage between culture and the local uh, active participation in culture and also the rest of the social life in the other part and the, the, other, the things happening. So now we want to see, can we do something in Sweden? Can we understand this model in the Swedish context? Can we give the Swedish regional policymakers a new instrument to make a better uh, political decision? Yeah, we, we hope so. So what we've been doing and what we continue to do now in, in the Västergötalands uh, region is to continue to map all culture activities. We will also map all culture facilities to understand the active culture part participation. And it's maybe not so complicated. What we do is we give every single activity a GIS coordinator, which means that we can load every single activity with a lot of statistics. All available databases we can add, uh, we can load this activity um, with. This means that every single activity will have a new value. And we are interested to see how this value of this individual's uh, activity can attract another one. And from this we can create a new pattern to understand culture's impact of social and economic development. So, oh, uh, something happened there. Um, anyway, <coughs> what, um, uh, what we are mapping is uh, culture activities, which are based uh, more or less on the uh, European Union's definition of culture. So, um, but uh, so we, when we start this process, we have um, first a workshop together with the regional actors to see if, if it's something specific that they are interested in. And, and here, the last one we did was in Skaraborg, and they were very interesting in, in their parks and so on, so we have gardening as well. Then we have the cultural facilities, and it's, it used to be very clear here, <laughs> but something happened. So <coughs> Halland was interesting, because in Halland, we, we made this study two years ago, I think it was, and in Halland we found 7,000, almost 7,000 activities. And one more time, it's very easy to say that here you can find the theaters around Halmstad, you can find the craftsmanship and, and uh, uh, Hemslöjd, more or less everywhere, but in the southern part, La Holm was very active in this sense. Music, you can hear everywhere in Halland. If you passed Halland, you can listen to it. Here it is, and uh, you will hopefully soon listen to a new conference about the music in Halland. And I hope that we not go to this uh, part in the middle there, because it seems to be completely silent there. Nothing happens there. You see, it's white, and uh, I've been there, it's quite good to be there, but um, it's not so much culture, because it's always white in this part. Anyway, advertising close to Gothenburg, not surprising. The conservation companies, mostly in, in the uh, inland, in the forest parts, not so much in the, in, the, in the towns. Anyway, if you give this to a decision maker, what kind of decision do you think she or he will make? Will it be a good one? Or will it be another one? I don't know. But it's not enough. It's not enough to make a good political decision to develop your region. For this we need 
a better understanding. So one more time, we need to understand the relation between this active participation and where can we find stronger parts in the region. So <coughs> it's uh, not just me and Pierluigi that are involved in this project. We also have another friend, Massimo Boschema, and um, he is very interesting. And maybe you think he's an artist, and maybe I also think he's an artist, but uh, this fantastic drawing here is actually an algorithm. So here he explained la cultura in Hollandia. <laughs> so, <coughs> so this is what it looks like. This is the culture in Holland. So we give this to the politician instead. Can they make a better political decision now? No, of course not. We need to translate that so they understand what we are talking about. So Massimo Bashema. He is a mathematician, and he is uh, mostly develop in developing what you can call self-learning processes, which is algorithms that take the new results from the previous uh, mathematical thing and understand it and develop it even further. Um, that's the best way I can translate it right now, but I can maybe do it better after a cup of coffee. So <coughs> anyway. We are looking for the clustering processes. Can we see how this relation between different kind of cultural activities, now loaded with socioeconomic uh, statistics, statistic, can we see that they actually merge together and also define what we can say, a new strong hub for culture-driven economy in the region? Yes, we think so. So what we found here, is, uh, sorry, it is a bit darker, but anyway, <coughs> you, you can see that it looks like something important is happening here and uh, something up, a little bit up. And um, um, something has happened to the slides here because uh, this morning the text was on the right hand side. I don't know what's happening here, sorry. But anyway, it's very clear that something happened in Halmstad and a little bit in Varberg and something happening in Kungsberg. So we can find the, the best uh, impact on active participation, participation in culture in, uh, in Halmstad in this case. But with this algorithm, as I said, it was self-learning. That means that we can continue this modeling and we can also find new results. So we can even forecast what will happen tomorrow. So based on the statistics from today, we can see what's happening tomorrow. And here suddenly we can see that culture in general will have a bigger impact on the regional development. But we can also see that this part suddenly became more important. And it's Falkenberg. Have you been to Falkenberg? Yeah. And you see what's happening in Falkenberg. I mean, you cannot stand still. I mean, whoosh. <laughs> and that was the train. Because what happened was that it built a new train station in Falkenberg. And one more time, we have a lot of new people coming to Falkenberg, but better, better communication, better infrastructure, better communicating people, but also better communicating their business, and, and a lot of things are happening now. The problem is <coughs> that it seems to be the same case in, as in Venice, because tomorrow it will disappear. Not Falkenberg, of course but the opportunities for regional development or local development. Why? Probably because they built the railway station exactly on the white spot in Holland. Remember where it was the lowest density of culture participation? There is where they put it. And that means that even if they have a lot of new people coming there, these new mm, ideas cannot grow because the mylla is not so fat that everyone else. So what we can provide a decision maker with now is where to find the fat mylla so the new ideas can grow up to, to, to something new. So th the next step what we're doing is to understand, um, oh, sorry, <coughs> to understand the relation between these uh, variables that we are talking about in the discussion here. So we can actually see how is the construction of the relation between different kinds of socioeconomic factors for, for sustainable development? And in this case, we can also identify the culture. So in the middle, which is the most important part, we find something 
statistics for what we think could be expressed as open-mindedness or something like that, or flexibilities, or yeah, I'm not afraid for new ideas, things. But here, up here, we find heritage, and but, uh, on the right hand side, a lot of cultural activities. I cannot see it now, but it's historic buildings, it's uh, visual arts, music, etc., cinemas, and here we also cultural activities. So what we see here is culture is not in the middle as we want to. If we speak to Pierre Lidisaki, it's supposed to be in the middle. It's not in the middle yet in, in, in Halland, it's far away. <coughs> but we can also see the relation for, um, if you speak about the conservation here, we can say that conservation seems to be more linked to educated people. The interest for historic buildings seems to be more interested for young people, especially girls. And uh, what we can call museum activities or, or cultural heritage activities seems to be more important in interest for an older group of people. So they are the relation to the statistics. So it could help us to develop our business, our uh, activities also in the culture field. But the interesting thing is, I know you, uh, is that um, uh, <coughs> we can also see what's happened if we, s we changed the, 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 the level of one of these statistics. So we can make simulations. What happened if we increase the value of one of these points? So what does it mean? It means that we can simulate political decisions. What happens if we take the initiative to do like this? Or we can simulate what happens if we have an investor doing this, etc. So this will give the politicians a completely new opportunity to make a better political decision. So we've done it also in Skarabar, and uh, it's more or less the same. Not so many points though, but uh, uh, I will not go to the details here, but it is, it's very interesting and very same. And we also have the clustering processes. And it was not so dramatic here because it was more <coughs> clear that we, it was more dense, so to say. And in the, in the end, it was a triangle with Fardship in Skara and Skövde that seems to dominate the whole thing. But uh, maybe more <coughs> interesting was the relation between the different points. So one more time, it was not so clearly just two angles. It was a very weak pattern. Sorry if it's, it should be more clear, but we cannot find this uh, junction here as in Halland, for instance. It was weaker. What does it mean? Uh, well, it, it's not so dependent on one single industry, so to say. It's more industries are, are, that are important for, for Skarabar. But we found the middle though there, and we can also find the culture. So to start with, the interesting point is the middle, of course. But here we can see that culture is absolutely in the end of the system. And we are interested to, to help it into the middle. So here is not affecting the economy as, it, as we thought it would be, especially if we heard what Pierre Lidi talked about before, mentioned Sweden number one, Sweden number one, Sweden number one, and of course, being Sweden and working with the culture 3.0 perspective, of course, we have to find a culture 3.0 everywhere in Sweden. Now here, <coughs> we were surprised because it seems that the point that has the most influence on the regional development in Skarabar is two years of secondary school. Is it good? Or is it good? Or is it not good? Well, you judge yourself. I can say that the way, one way to understand this is if you have a new idea, it better be explained in a way that someone from a two-year secondary school can understand it. So <coughs> it's not knowledge-driven economy as we had used to talk about for the last decades. We can find it. It's something else here. And um, um, that is uh, of real big interest. But here we, we were looking for the culture, and culture was in the far end. Also the cult creative industries were in the far end. So <coughs> here, for instance, we can find culture, as you can see, a dance, etc. But inside, meaning that had a bigger impact on the relation on the regional development here, was statistics for our, uh, agriculture, hunting and fishery, and, and things like that. 
And if you go a little bit north, uh, sorry, if you go up here, you find culture, but inside also the income for retired people. Meaning that the income for the retired people have more influence on their economic development in, in Skarborg than what we learned from before, cultural activities. So this was dramatic in our research. Here we find video games and music um, students. And here in Gotland, of course, we know that the, there is a good education here for video gaming and programming in Gotland, but they also have a good one. The other good one is in Skövde. So that is obvious, okay? There's a connection, better connection, especially with the more educated um, parts of, of Skaraborg with the video gaming and also the music studios. And being in Skaraborg, of course, you know the reason, the background to the music studios. Anyway, uh, you talked about specific uh, participation. So the, the conclusion here is, what's happening now in Skaraborg? And how can you translate this? And how can you explain it for the de decision makers? How can you design it for, uh, describe it for the decision making processes? Well, what we are doing at the moment is to, to produce a guide for decision making. So it is hopefully an easy one to understand these rather complicated figures and illustrations and maps. So this is what we do at the moment. But <coughs> what we can say that SCORA shows very clearly very similarities to, to what we did find in, in, um, in Venice. Uh, sorry, Falkenberg. Um, we can also see that the cult impact on culture is increasing in, in Haaland, but it seems to be concentrated to, 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 to Halmstad. Um, in Skarabar, well, it is something that um, could be described as a, a transmission from the culture 1.0, actually, to, to, to the culture 2.0. So <coughs> what we do now is to see can we, of course, we need more knowledge, we have more research going on to see it, understand on a more detailed level. But we also see if we can create some um, uh, projects to start to uh, emphasize the emerging culture activities and so on. And uh, I can also say that <laughs> when I presented this in Haaland, um, I also invited the, the directors for the big bank and uh, the directors from the big bank, they saw the opportunity here immediately. So right after the meeting, I <coughs> asked them to cooperate with us and I offered him the map for one million Swedish krona. And he said, okay, I take it. Why? Because he saw the opportunities. He saw that what we were describing was the future um, best part of how to grow the new business. And what we also present was a new actors there, the culture actors that could be influenced the new economy. So for him, it was a new problem. Still, it's a problem to, to design it so it will be, have this political effect. But uh, we, we are doing this, and we will do it uh, hopefully very soon. And now we start <coughs> the next part of Restoratalam, and then we will be finished the whole thing in a rather short period here. So what are the opportunities to, for the conservation, for instance? Well, um, uh, if you have the time, you can go to the museum on Friday, I think. Is it a museum, the conference? Yeah, because <coughs> I will make a presentation there how this can be boiled down to, to conservation policies and how to understand heritage-led um, regional development programs. And um, recently, I think it was last week, over the week before, the European Commission launched a new ad agenda for cultural heritage research and innovation. And uh, I've been one of the um, uh, writers for this report. I've been involved in the expert group. So we have talked about the new opportunities for cultural heritage within this uh, paradigm, so to say. And the interesting thing was uh, when we started the process, it was very understandable, the, the game we were playing. Because we were invited to have the new strategy for cultural heritage research in whole Europe. And the European Union, the European Commission said to us, we are facing two problems. We are facing two European uh, problems for the European uh, Commission, com for the European Union. And that is one political crisis and one financial crisis. And you know about the financial crisis. The political crisis is Today, they have many 
political parties in the European Parliament that want to destroy the EU from the inside. So all our resources from the, in the com Commission, all our resources in the European Union will go to solve these two important political questions. We don't have time for anything else. We need to be better on what we're good at. We need to face the big problems. So the question from us to you is, can you explain why we should work with cultural heritage in these times of political crisis? So this is what we try to explain here. And <coughs> the answer to this is heritage-led regional development. And being in Visby, being at Campus Scotland, I'm very happy to tell you that we can give you a masterclass in this. So if you are very kind, you can ask us to participate in what we call Bevara Använda Utveckla, which is also the national mission to the, uh, to the state heritage policies today. And here we try to understand the new concept of sustainable development. We try to understand a new concept of inclusiveness, sustainability, and, and, um, and innovation-driven economy. We try to understand what is the impact or what are the impacts on, on smart specialization strategies and how can we clarify the importance of heritage in this uh, situation. So it's m mostly based on Pierre Louis de Sacco's theory about cutter 3.0 smart specialization strategies, and how to, to define and develop heritage-led reg um, uh, sustainable regional development programs in this side. So please be welcome to apply for this. And um, if you don't remember my telephone number, it is here. So thank you very much. Grazie mille. Nu finns det också möjlighet att ställa frågor. You also had the opportunity to ask questions, uh, both to Mr. Gustafsson and Mrs. Sacco. So anyone who would like to use the opportunity, just give me a hand up and I will come to you with the microphone. Can I start? Please. Yeah. <coughs> um, I just, uh, when we gave my presentation, I, I was thinking, of something I couldn't really express. C can you help me to express sure. a thought here? And it is um, just a comparison between Visby and Venice. I mean, here in Visby, we, we are facing a new opportunity to increase the number of tourists. Um, and then I, I don't know if anybody expressed the, the aim of this thing. Is it to become the new Venice in times of more tourist? Or um, what is your experience from? Um, tourist and world heritage sites and the number one tourist uh, goal, so to say. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think it's an interesting comparison because, you know, if you look at Venice from the traditional point of view of policymakers still today, it's really a success of I mean, 25 million people per year. Basically, everybody that wants to rent their house make a living out of that. But what's the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that people to make a living out of that, move to the mainland. And they basically transform their house into a bed and breakfast. So as a consequence of this, even thinking of cultural participation is hilarious in a place like this. Because you cannot really participate to anything but to give space to tourists. And as a consequence of this, what kind of business tourists really want? Uh, to be crude, crappy souvenirs, most of which not made there. For example, Venice, as you know, as a history long uh, tradition in uh, glass blowing in Murano. Practically nothing in Murano today is produced in Murano. It, it arrives from China. And they pretend there is Murano glass. So, of course, all the social knowledge behind this has been lost completely. Um, the very physical survival of the heritage is endangered not just by the subsidence and the water but really by the physical consummation of the fact that this is not a place where 25 million people per year should be. Uh, so, um, it's like, uh, I mean, um, it's like uh, producing energy by burning your boiserie. Of course, you make a lot of heat, but once you've burned, you're burned. Um, so, in terms of sustainability, I think it's really, really an unwise strategy. But on the other hand, 
Why it is happening? One could say, okay, but the Venetians are not stupid. So what's the, what's the matter? The matter, very simply, is that it's so convenient to go on with the situation and the vested interests for this are so widespread that it's practically impossible to propose anything else. Because immediately, the impact, of course, would be dramatic. Of course, you could create something completely different. Think, for example, places like Venice could become very easily a global cultural hub that is completely inhabited by cultural producers. And it could be something that, I mean, everybody would invest on, uh, at the cre creative powerhouse uh, for so many different industries. Um, but the point is that the transition is almost impossible. At the same time, on the mainland, you have so many creative companies today, uh, Christer was citing a few of them, that would immensely benefit from this. And by not doing this, they are moving their own research and development centers elsewhere, in other continents, possibly. So, I mean, from the, from the global strategy point of view, it's really a tremendous, a tremendous outcome. On the other hand, the maps that Christer showed uh, date back to 2007. So we have had a lot of time to show the decision makers, the politicians, what would be the likely outcome of the existing policy. Uh, ironically, and I'll explain in a moment why, but uh, this research was commissioned with the European money by the region of Veneto. But when we showed the maps to the policymakers, they were simply unable to understand. Not only the policymakers and the politicians in Venice, but the politicians in Vicenza that were the ones that were on the red spot. And when it was so clear that that was the golden occasion for them to profit from an extremely active pattern of local cultural participation, I experienced it myself because I was called by the city of Vicenza initially to tap into this opportunity. But then for a serious reason, when it was a fully fledged developed model based on this kind of policy design evidence, um, someone else arrived and said, but it's much better and much easier to bring here block blockbuster exhibitions. And this is what they did. And as a consequence of this, now they are happy with their blockbuster exhibitions, but it, they're becoming a little Venice. And as a consequence of this, the big companies that would have invested massively in a new culture and creative hub in Vicenza that are based, let's say, 20 kilometers away from there, they are looking at other countries. So, you know, that's the problem. The link between what I have discussed and what Christer has shown, uh, maybe at the first glance, uh, could, could uh, require some reflection. But it's extremely important that if you really want to go for a inclusive cultural policy, you have to be informed of the consequences. On the other hand, these kind of maps, they are not only for the benefit of politicians, they are for the benefit for the cultural sector, for the civil society. So if you want uh, to create a really participatory strategy, this kind of knowledge must be shared and can be shared and can be the basis of something that today in the cultural field is very difficult. Decide on the basis of some practical evidence. Because, you know, at the moment, in the cultural field, I know very well, I mean, I'm very sympathetic about, about that, by the way, but of course you, you have an advocacy strategy which is very simple. We are culture, culture is important, give us money. But, I mean, this doesn't work. Or better, doesn't work anymore. So the only way to really make it work is to, I mean, connect this more significantly to these processes of local development and to, in some sense, um, uh, open up to the possible opportunities. Think, for example, of what uh, Christer showed about Falkenberry. Um, it was clear, and it reflected by the data, that in the middle term, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the medium run, a Falkenberry could become an interesting place. But if you didn't support this properly, it would vanish in the medium long run. Uh, these kind of things happen all the time. Sometimes we decide to build a new museum or a new auditorium in the wrongest possible place. Uh, this is not a fault of culture. But if you do it, once you do it, this is damaging culture forever. 
So what we really need from this point of view is a real evidence base in the sake, for the sake of culture, in the interest of cultural producers, to make it more effective and to tap into the real... Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, but I, I was finished. <laughs> Okay, my name is Anna Herlitschka and I would like to, to widen the, the, the scope of culture, uh, comparing uh, Visby and maybe not Venice, but Visby in, in a way, to Åre, a skiing resort in the north of Sweden. Åre has a lot of peop people moving there and there's a lot of companies started, there's a lot of companies actually living, growing and start to exporting things. I'm, I'm definitely pro-participatory processes. I think that's, that's brilliant. Actually, that's what I'm working with here in Sweden. But my question to you is, if you widen the, the scope of what policy actually should do, isn't policy about um, policy making, which is about the living conditions, creating good living conditions, flexible solutions for everybody, and thus attracting people to nice locations rather than cultural policies? Well, you know, very interesting question, thank you. The two things I, I, I think are deeply related uh, because in the end what makes a place attractive uh, is a very complex combination of things. Um, and by the way, there, there begins to be research on this, on the... Um, a perception of attractiveness of alternative urban milieus. And it's almost invariably true that uh, culture is a big component in this. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think uh, it's very important to understand that what culture can do by empowering people is to transform the conditions for this attractiveness dramatically. Uh, I, again, I would like to make an example. Uh, think of what's happening today in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm? It's been uh, for a long time one of the most, or the coolest, the most attractive place in the world. Uh, but it's dying of its own success because what's happening today is that the level of gentrification that is created by the expansion of the big uh, digital companies is so dramatic that it's becoming impossible for everybody with a decent level of wage which is not, I mean, a super, super, I mean, privileged worker to live actually there. As a consequence of this, you are witnessing the creation of um, gated communities in a place like San Francisco, which is unbelievable. Whereas places that were totally unlikely ones, like Austin, uh, which is uh, probably the next generation of the high-tech hubs, um, are doing exactly the opposite. You are in a situation in which, thanks to the level of, because, you know, interestingly, um, San Francisco has been a cultural hub of the United States for a very long time, but the independent culture in San Francisco has been absolutely marginal in the development of the new tech economy in San Francisco. This is not happening in Austin. In Austin, the relationship between the basic cultural community and the community of innovators is substantial. And for example, the evolution of South by Southwest that is becoming one of the global festivals for radical innovation where culture acts as a mediator as developed from a cultural festival. And interestingly, in Austin, there is a very big push by local entrepreneurs to share part of their profits to ensure that the real estate dynamics does not, go, does not become wild, to ensure that certain level of uh, cultural diversity and inclusiveness is preserved. So I think that the two conditions are very deeply linked. And uh, sometimes where they, are, where they seem not to be is before, because probably they have not focused properly on this. Of course, I mean, it's not a religion, it's not a dogma. Maybe there are cases where this is not happening. But in my personal experience, I must say that so far, that I have examined so many different local contexts. I mean, culture basically always plays a role. Can I, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, what you describe here is what the smart strategy, specialization strategies are aiming at. So the smart specialization strategies or the, the more overarching you know, regional policy is to be a better place to live. This is the general objective. And you also do find a na name for these strategies. In Sweden, a halla is, is Besta Boplatsen. That is the name of the regional strategy. And, and in Gothenburg, I forgot it, but it's something similar, the best place to be or something. So this is the idea. 
So, but how can regional and local politicians, decision makers, investors, universities, trade unions, etc., et et together create such an environment? Well, there are some strategies, and we show them here. This is the, the, the general framework, so to say. But culture is not there. So what we understand is culture has the biggest impact on this question. So how can culture can be a stronger player in these small specialization strategies? And this is what we try to explain today. So, so your question is one, so let's say, one level above. So we were trying to, to explain how can also culture participation increase the level of well-being. We have another question down in the other corner. Yeah, I come from uh, the National Archives, and we have an archive here in Visby too. Uh, I would like to ask you, how, what do you see as the main mission or the main task for the uh, cultural institutions, like archives, museums, who are financed by tax money? I mean, uh, we're talking about culture and cultural activities on the local area, on the regional area, but you have also uh, with digitalization and IT society and so on, you can spread it from one place to all over the, the country. Is what we're now talking about very much open data. And uh, the European, uh, EU will now set the PSI uh, legislation. Is that something who can be a, a main task for these tax financed? Uh, cultural institutions. I mean, we can digitalize our, just here on Visby, about five million photos, films, and if we have, I'm, I'm sure, on the Nordic Museum, on the National Archives in Stockholm, we have photos, films, etc., etc., who's not from Stockholm, who's not from all over the country. Is that a main task for us to be some kind of engine? I think there is a big opportunity in this particular respect, and it has to do with how the very notion of heritage itself, itself evolves in this respect. Uh, I mean, we didn't really have the time to elaborate, but uh, very easily you can reason in terms of heritage 1, 2, and 3.0. And in particular, what is interesting about heritage 3.0 is not, not simply to make contents available. Of course, you have to digitalize because it's the best way to, to I mean, preserve and use at the same time. But you also have to create the conditions for a different usage. And in particular, this means that, for example, archives, you can see them as repository of ideas and repositories of meaning that are not interrogated enough, which means that, for example, you can really develop interdisciplinary endeavors to, in some sense, and and live in archives. For example, I am collaborating in this moment very much with the School of Humanities at Harvard University, where the Harvard Meta Lab is developing a fantastic new way of building uh, living archives. So working on new procedures of interrogation of archives, new procedures of classification, new capability building strategies that really enable people to make something out of it. And they chose, by the way, extremely Strange things like the Harvard Herbarium, for example, that could seem something that's only interested to botanists, that becomes a fantastic repository for storytelling, for example, for the, for the Harvard community. Um, that's the point. So I think it's crucial, and I think it's one of the big chapters of what I call digital heritage. But digital heritage, not just in terms of digitalizing contents, but using digital platforms as a totally different way to make use of archives. This, I think, is the real issue. And I, I focused on archives because this was your, but of course, with the basically all, all cultural institutions, you can make a reasoning about how the mission can adapt. Think of libraries, for example. Libraries is a clear case in point from this point of view. I think we have to, to stop now to, to keep our schedule. Uh, on behalf of the Swedish Exhibition Agency, I would like to thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here, and thank you all for coming. Have thank a you. nice end thank of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.